All right, what's the theme music? Mission Impossible. Those of you that are my age remember that very well, don't you? Some of you younger ones are probably wondering. You, you only know the new Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise. You don't really know the original Mission Impossible, or, right? Good morning to all of you. Hey, uh, how many of you woke up on a, with a new mission and a new purpose today? How many of you woke up with a hangover today? <laughs> okay, don't answer that question. <laughs> and apparently, if, I, if, I, if there's 170 people registered, uh, some of them didn't wake up this morning. So I can see that that's... Uh, and uh, it's like being in church, everybody's in the back row. A couple, couple folks up in the front here. Of course, you probably have to be on stage with me. That's probably why you're up here. Which is not so bad because uh, I usually call, I get very excited about when I, when I have the opportunity to speak places and I'm very passionate about what I talk about. Um, and you'll find out what that is in just a few minutes. But um, I, I, I kind of spit and sputter a bit too because I get really excited about it and I just lost my, there it is. And so I kind of call this, this area right up front here. You ever been to SeaWorld? This is called the splash zone, right? This is what this would be if, if you were up here in front, so it's probably a good thing you're not up here. I might even jump off the stage and just walk back there just because, you know, I can. Um, hey, I've, I've been, I always want to look this way to, this, to the screen, but it's not there. It's over here today. So um, I've been following things. I haven't been here the two days. I've been on the road. Uh, I was in Utah yesterday, Moab, Utah. Anybody ever been to Moab, Utah? That is a beautiful place. Unbelievable. I drove down from Salt Lake City to Moab. It was a beautiful, beautiful drive. I was there yesterday, so I, but I've been following everything on Twitter as best I can, although it's really hard to follow Twitter because you can get lost, especially with all the politics stuff that gets mixed in. Um, but I've been kind of watching, you know, who's been up here and the different things they've been talking about, and I, and I don't have any pink socks, but I do have some polka dot socks if you want to check those out later. But I also saw the board out front that said, you know, the top 10 tweets and the top 10 mentions or whatever, and I said, well, you know what? I'm competitive. I have to be on that list, right? So I have my, my Twitter account up there, Mark A. Noon. Go ahead and tweet out all morning. Anything you, you find that's on the screen, feel free to do that. I'm a very competitive kind of person. I have a Fitbit in my arm this morning, and I've already been out running early this morning because I'm in competition. I have a work week hustle. Anybody do Fitbit? Got a work week hustle going on right now. I'm, my kids and I are right at the top of the list, so I can't let them beat me. You know, just because I'm 50 years old doesn't mean I, I have to succumb to, to my kids who are only in their 20s. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very competitive in that way. So please tweet out some things this morning. We're talking about mission telemedicine. And really what that means comes from, for me, as a mission, um, because I have, a, I have an Air Force background. I'm retired uh, 20 and a half years in the Air Force. Any military folks served in, out there? Anybody? Nobody? We've got one in the back? One? Very good. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you for your service. So when I talked to, to Dr. Hensel, I talked to Jamie about, uh, you know, the opportunity to be here. They said, hey, let's put a kind of a military theme to it. So you see my special operator guys up there on the screen, which I spent five years in a special operations base. Um, I also have a son who's in the Air Force who is uh, becoming a special operator. So it's very near and dear to my heart when it comes to the mission of what we do. But really, the mission telemedicine is this. It's transforming the patient experience. And that's how I want to tie these kind of things together today and talk about how do we make that the most effective how do we create an environment and a culture and experience for patients that is far beyond anything they've ever seen before? I know following the tweets in the last couple of days, the real focus, a lot of focus you've had has been on the future of healthcare. And really, how does telemedicine, how does uh, the language access network, all of those things fit into that future? And I really want to bring that together for you today. I want to talk about purpose. Because when we have a mission, we have a purpose too. We have a mission, we have a vision, but we also have a purpose for what we do. And I want to really tie that in together. You know, when you're the guy that's got the slides and you got the clicker in your hand and you're up front, you get to show whatever pictures you want. So you always show your kids on there or your family, right, because you're so proud of them and excited to, to have the opportunity just to brag on them. That's what Facebook's all about, right, is your opportunity to tell all the world about the great things your kids do every day. But this is my family right here. I have, I have two boys and two girls and, and my wife of 28 years, Michelle. And the reason I put that up there is not because I'm so proud of them, which I am, and, and, and the fact that some of them actually look like me and they're still good looking, um, is the fact that... They, they, I reference some things with them when I talk, and I want to kind of give you that visual so you understand what that means. I live in uh, Destin, Florida. Anybody ever been to Destin, Florida? The whitest sand beaches in the world. Anybody from Florida? Got one here? Where are you from in Florida? Miami. Miami? She's way, 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 way away from me. It's, I can drive to Las Vegas easier than I can drive to Miami about where I live in, in Florida. But I live in this little town in, in near Destin. Actually, I don't live in Destin. I, I can't, uh, the, the studio group that I work for doesn't pay me well enough to live in Destin, but I live near Destin. I live in a town called Niceville, Florida. Niceville is the name of my town. Now, it gets better than that because not only do I live in a town called Niceville, Florida, I live on a street called Sparkleberry Cove in Niceville, Florida. Does it get any better, right? You talk about the ideal. Perfect, perfect. So I said I spent 20 and a half years in the Air Force. I, I retired out of that area. There's a couple of Air Force bases there that I, I was participating in. I lived all over the, the country, 
been around the world and with the Air Force as well. Um, let's talk a little bit, and I want to give a little bit of background. So I work for a company called the Studer Group. Anybody ever heard of the Studer Group? Good, we got some folks over here that have heard of the Studer Group. Um, we're a healthcare coaching organization. We're really about making healthcare better. Welcome, welcome Malcolm Baldridge Award winner. It's a very honorable opportunity for me to work with the Studer Group. When I spent the last five and a half years I spent in the Air Force, I was really coaching and teaching a lot of the stuff that, that I teach now in the Studer Group that I speak about. Um, but I just want to tie these things together, kind of give you a little bit of an understanding of where we come from and what we do in the hospitals. We work with over 800 hospitals around the country. Um, we're in, in a given year, we're in at least 1,500 different hospitals, um, which is a great honor and a privilege to be able to serve the population that takes good care of our patients. Some of the things we do is we build skills. How many of you became a leader and had, didn't have any idea what you were doing the day you became a leader? Anybody? Yeah, I've been there. Right? We probably, a lot of us have been there. I just read this study. Gallup did a survey. It was on Fox Business Report this last week. Uh, Gallup did a study that said only 18% of leaders who are put into a position of leadership actually have the skills to do the job. 18%. So a lot of what I focus on in, in my work and when I speak places is about how do we develop leaders? Because we can't transform healthcare until we change how we develop leaders. 18%, that was a phenomenal number. I would have never guessed it was that low. But I've been there, because I was a lab tech. A lab, clinical lab is my background, so I was a lab tech, literally on a Friday, and on Monday I became a lab director. What was my training to become a lab director? A weekend to think about it, right? You've been there. You're a really, really good nurse, we're gonna make you the nurse manager. You're really, really good IT, you're gonna make you the IT manager. How does that happen? It, it's not necessarily a wrong thing, but are we always prepared to do that? So we build skills with organizations. We get great results because we build skills and we transform healthcare. We transform cultures which transform healthcare. That's our focus. Our mission is to make healthcare better. If I could take everything else off the screen right there, I would take off and only take off everything and leave on, we make healthcare better. Isn't that really your mission? What all of you are participating in while you're at this conference is to learn how to be better at what you do to make healthcare better in whatever capacity that is. And I love telemedicine. I love the, the access that you have to, to the networks that you have to make healthcare better. I, I work with a lot of rural hospitals. A lot of places that are, I mean, literally, when I drove to Moab, Utah, that is a four hour drive from Salt Lake City. That is rural. You can't get much more rural than that. Guess what? Is there a great need for the services, for, for technological services? Absolutely. I coach in a hospital on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts. That's a terrible, horrible place that I have to go about for three times a year. But this is 35 miles out to sea. There's a tremendous need for technological services. People just can't drive to the nearest hospital. They have to get on a boat or take an airplane and go somewhere. They transport patients is by helicopter to make healthcare better. We do that three ways. We do it by making it a great place to work. Is every organization that you are representing today a great place to work? And also, in addition to that, do we not only make it a great place to work because we have to have engaged workforce, we have to have people who want to be at work, but we also have to have the practice of medicine, which is where you guys come in really, really strongly. The efficiencies, the things that I hear from physicians and providers all over the country is this. They get bogged down in the electronic medical record. They get bogged down in the processes. They get bogged down in the processes between sending their patient from the clinic to the hospital and all the paperwork and all the the uh, um, red tape that gets in the way of just taking good care of patients. We want, to we want to make that better. We want to make the practice of medicine better. And then the ultimate outcome of that is what you're all here for too is to transform healthcare, to make the great place for patients to receive care. We're an intellectual resource. We have a lot of resources that we provide so that you can do your job so much more effectively and better. That's our goal, that's our mission. Now your mission is what you do. And I would imagine that if I were to pull up all of your organizations and, and, and put them on the screen here, there would be a mission statement. This is what we do. Then there'd be a vision statement, right? Where do you want to be? Where do you see yourself a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? I think that's a lot of what you talked about this week too in the future of healthcare. Where do we fit in that? But what I want to focus in on a lot right now in the next few minutes is about the purpose. The reason I asked you if you woke up with a new mission or a new purpose this morning is hopefully you've, you've gained some information and you've talked and networked with the people around you this week. To, to refocus your purpose. Why do I do what I do? This morning I woke up with purpose. I wake up most mornings with purpose. I'm a very early riser. And when you, I live in central time zone, so I'm already two hours ahead of schedule, right? So this morning was pretty easy to get up in, real early and go for my morning run. 
And I was out running and I was thinking about my purpose. I was thinking about my time with you guys today, thinking about the time that I, the things that I do and what my purpose is. And I get up most days, most days, not all days, most days excited about that purpose because it connects me to what I do. It connects me to the vision and the mission. It's that purpose. And here's the thing about purpose. We coach this all the time. You've ever seen this, health, this flywheel from our organization, the healthcare flywheel. It's adapted from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. And that flywheel is how we, we, we have motivation. We have passion to do what we do, which is what I call the courage to do what you do every single day. It's the risk-taking that you do every day to make healthcare better. It's the courage you have to encourage other people to do, take risks and to make healthcare better. And when we do that, we add what we call the prescriptives. And the prescriptives are the things that we do. It's the things that you do every single day. It's the execution of it is what makes it work. We can think about some great things and have great vision, but you know, vision without execution is what Thomas Edison called hallucination, right? <laughs> Anybody ever have vision without execution? Yes, you all did on January 1st of this year, didn't you? You had great vision when you woke up January 1st or maybe January 2nd if it took you that long to get out of bed. And you looked in the mirror and you said, oh my gosh, what do I have to do, right? I need to either lose weight, get in shape, get better, stop doing this, be a better husband, be a better wife, whatever that might be. That was your vision. I work out in a, in a local gym at my Air Force base where I live, and, and there's like 10 of us every morning. We're the early bird, 4 o'clock in the morning kind of people. And, you know, we kind of own the gym, or we think we do, because we're the ones that are there all year long. We hate the first week of January. It's when all the resolutioneers show up. And, and as we call them, resolutioneers, right? And, and they're, they're using our machines and our equipment. You know, that's what we think, because we, like, we own the place. But we always know by about the first week of February, or at least by Valentine's Day, those people are all back to hallucination, and we're back to just owning the gym again. But we have to have execution in what we do. Now, if you're from the state of Texas, I know that the word execution means something different to you than you do if you're in Las Vegas. I get that. But I'm talking specifically about how we execute things, how we make things happen. And then the, the bottom line is the results that we get because of that. We win when we get those results. And what happens is when we get results, it fuels our passion to continue to do the things that we know are the right things to do. And I love that. I love it. That's why it gets me up motivated and excited in the morning. But I really want to focus on the middle part, which is the purpose. And what I love about healthcare is the fact that we make a difference every single day. We have meaning. Worthwhile work. Now, I don't say that other industries and organizations don't have that, but there is something unique about when you tie what you do to a patient's life. When you see the transformation in a patient's care, when a patient comes in on a stretcher in an ambulance and almost dead, as I was in a hospital just recently in Missouri, and this woman was, was talking about how she came in and they were literally about ready to call it dead on arrival and they revived her. And she walked out of that hospital two weeks later. That's the worthwhile work that, that we do. And what's ma what makes a difference, but it's the purpose. And so here's the thing about purpose. When we know our purpose, we can have well-defined, clear expectations about what we're going to do. Let me give you an example of that. My son, who you saw in the, in the, in the picture, um, is 26 years old. He works for the Memphis Redbird baseball team. He's the director of fan engagement. I mean, it's just, it's an awesome job. He loves it. He gets to do all the on-field activities and manage the scoreboard and all these kind of things. He's 26 years old. He manages more people than I ever did in all my days in the Air Force. With 26, it's amazing that he has that opportunity. He has a third baseline window view from his office, an office that I would have dreamed of over the years. He started that job a year ago. He, he got hired about a week before the season started. Now, when you're the director of fan engagement and your sole purpose is to engage fans in the, pro, in the, the game of baseball, and you start a week before, and you never worked in a baseball world before, it's a big, I mean, it's a, it's a tough job. It's a new experience. And of course, being a student group coach and speaker that I am, I always talk about goals and I talk about purpose. And I said to him, I said, as soon as he got the job, I said, what are your goals? He said, I don't know. I said, what are the expectations of your job? He said, I don't know. I don't know. We haven't had that conversation yet. The season's starting next week. We got all these things we have to do. So he had all these things he had to get done. And he really didn't know his purpose. I mean, his job title says director of fan engagement. But that's not his purpose. And he didn't know what his purpose was. So when he doesn't know what his purpose is, he doesn't know what the expectations are in his job. And so he went through the entire year really struggling because he kept adding in responsibilities to his job because he didn't know his purpose. And here's the thing about when you know your purpose, you can easily say no. Now, I don't mean things like I would go, well, it's not my job. You know, that's not teamwork. 
But to know your purpose is this. He knew what his job, if he knew what his job responsibilities were, when people would come to him and say, Taylor, I need you to do this, he wouldn't have to say yes. He could say, you know what? That's not within the scope of my job. That's so-and-so's job. Not, that's not my job. Not that kind of an attitude, but it doesn't fit the purpose of what I'm hired for. Studer Group, we work strictly in healthcare. We get asked all the time. So we got 40 speakers, 80 coaches. We get asked all the time to go to other places. Like I was asked one time to go and work with a bank who wanted to improve employee engagement. I said, that's great, we would love to do that, but that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to make healthcare better. Now we do some speaking engagements for other industries and organizations and that's okay, but our purpose allows us to say no. It gives us clear, defined expectations. We know, um, because what happens is abuse happens if we don't know our purpose. So my son, could, they could literally abuse him in the sense, and I don't mean abuse like they're beating on him, I mean take advantage of him if he doesn't know what his goals and expectations are, if he doesn't know his purpose. And we have a lot of purpose-oriented people, but we need a lot more purpose-driven people. My son last year was purpose-oriented. He kind of knew what his purpose was and he was focused on, he was trying to make it better. This year now he's had some time and we've talked about goals, and we talked about plans and how do we get to those goals. And now he's more purpose driven. And he can sometimes say, that's not our focus. Our focus is here. So we have to know our purpose. And I hope today when you leave here, if you know nothing else and learn nothing else, you, learn, you ask yourself, what is my purpose? And maybe today you even define what that purpose is. The biggest obstacle in achieving high performance is a needed urgency for change, is what John John Cotter said in his book, Sense of Urgency. Now, you've probably been places where you had people who had a sense of urgency, and they're the people that are running around crazy all the time with this tremendous sense of urgency, but yet they never get anything done. That's not the kind of urgency I'm talking about. I'm talking about the urgency you have when you're on an airplane, and just when you're starting to descend, you know when you know you're starting to descend, you got that 20-minute time frame. And I fly a lot, so I know this. I got this down to a science. 20 minutes, they say, we're going to land. That's when they lock the seat belts down, They're, you're not supposed to get out of your seat, and if you haven't used the restroom, you're stuck, right? Although there's a few of them that sneak out and they get yelled at by the flight attendant, but they at least went to the bathroom, that was a... And then the plane lands, and you think, okay, I can make it to the gate, and then the, gate, the plane gets stuck on the tarmac. And you're waiting for your gate to open because you're early, and you thought you had enough time to get to the gate and you were gonna get your luggage and get out the plane and to the restroom, and that sense of urgency increases, doesn't it? So sometimes as leaders, we have to create a sense of urgency within our departments and our organizations that isn't this running around like we're crazy, we don't know what we're doing, we're, we're, we're trying frantically to get things done, but that we have a sense of urgency that says this is the right thing to do, it's the right time to do it, and we need to move with it. I have an organization I work with in Denver that I've been struggling with for about a year because they've had a lot of changes. Leadership, they're doing a merger with another organization, you know, because some of you probably been part of something like that. And so it's been difficult to get them to move. And I've created this great sense of urgency with them right now. I'm going to be on site with them in about a month. I'm sorry, two weeks. It's March already, isn't it? I'm going to be on site with them in about two weeks. And I am going to create some very strong urgency for them to get things done because they have been waiting for about a year to really move forward. And now when we get to move forward, we're going to really have some strong, good results with them. But it's about being purpose-driven, not purpose-oriented to create that urgency. Leadership, we have to have strong leadership. And I know we're talking about transforming patient experience and the care of patients, but it all starts with leadership. Here's what I know, is that you might have low performers in your organization who don't do a good job for whatever reason. Is that because they're low performers? Or is it because they don't have good leadership? So it starts with leadership. And you've gotta be a strong leader yourself before you can even develop leaders around you. Remember I said I was a lab tech on Friday. Monday I'm a lab director. What was my training? A weekend to think about it. I had a lot of developmental leadership training in the Air Force. I didn't have a lot of lab training in the Air Force on how to be a lab director. Didn't know how to manage a budget. I didn't know how to spend the money. Didn't know how to manage it. I knew how to work side by side with my coworkers, but I didn't know how to manage those coworkers because I hadn't been, uh, had that development opportunity. As our ability increases, so does the attraction to our organization. So does the attraction to our department. Any, any single guys out there? Okay, single guys, you don't, have to you don't have to pursue that which you can attract, okay? So rather than pursue good talent, we want to attract good talent to the organization. We do that by being the very best leaders that we can be. If we are not good leaders, why would anybody want to come work with us? 
So we can't transform patient care until we transform the culture and the employee, employee engagement that we have, and we do that by starting with good leadership development. The true measure of leadership development is this. Do your leaders have to step up to the role, or can they simply step in? So I'm working actually on a book right now called Set Up to Step In. Because here's my philosophy. If I prepared my folks really, really well to step into a role, they don't have to step up to it. They can move into it. Here's my example. So my other, one of my other kids in the picture is my daughter, Hannah. She's a senior in college. She plays volleyball. She's a setter on a volleyball team. Hannah is the least athletic of the four children, but she's the most gifted, skilled player of all the sports that my kids have done. My kids have done football and, and volleyball. She's very, very skilled. We sent her to the best camps, sent her to the best instructors. We developed her because, one, she wasn't the most athletic, so she couldn't rely on that athletic talent as much as she could her skills, and she has a great set of hands. And if you know anything about volleyball, setting is all about the hands. It's all about the control. She has beautiful ball control. So when she got the opportunity, times when she was like a, you know, the, the backup setter in, in her early days, and they would say, hey, Hannah, we need you to go in. And she went in and she played marvelously, and they, they, they won a match, or they won a game, or they, you know, she played as the, the, the very best that she could play. The coach would always say this, hey, Hannah really stepped up today. And I know that's intended to be a compliment, and I accept it as such. But in my mind, I'm thinking, no, she didn't. She simply stepped in. She knew what to do. She had been trained and prepared for that day for so long. That's where we have to be in leader development in order to transform patient care, in order to transform the culture of the employees that we work with, is we have to prepare them enough to step into a role that they don't have to step up. In organizations that are very small, there isn't always a leadership role to step into, right? Because, hey, I've been the leader there for a year. I'm 35 years old. I'm not going anywhere for 15 or 20 years. There's no place, nobody's going to take my place. So but do we still prepare people who work with us and work under us so that they can step into a role at some point in time? Leadership development, this is where it is. You can attract versus having to pursue the law of attraction. As your ability increases, so does your ability to attract good talent. If you're looking for good players, be the very best coach. We've got to harvest great stories in order to build the legends and the legacies of our organizations. Stories build legends, and legends build legacy. Here's why that's so important. The culture of an organization is the stories that are told. If any of you grew up in a, in a large family, let's say, with a lot of history, you heard a lot of stories about your grandparents and your great-grandparents and those that came over from other countries and immigrated here, or those that, that raised you know, up a family out of the, the, the dirt in, in western Oklahoma or wherever those kind of places. Those are legends. Those are stories that were told, handed down from generation to generation, and they design and they build the culture of your particular family. The same happens in our organizations. The stories that we tell will build the legends that will build the legacies. And if you hold yourself to an ideal, and nothing stops you from getting to that ideal, you become something greater. You become legend. By the way, that was a quote from Batman. That was nothing I made up. <laughs> But it's the legends that build the legacy. What is the legacy you want to leave behind? What is the legacy in telemedicine? What is the legacy in, in language translation that you want to leave behind for future generations? Those are told through the stories. And if you don't know what those stories are and you're not harvesting those stories, when we coach organizations, we coach this very same principle of every time you have a meeting, every time you have a, a monthly conversation, a, a evaluation conversation with your staff, the first thing we ask is what's working really well. Who's doing a great job at what we're doing? Who's making a difference and why are they making a difference? And we share those stories. When we coach people to round on patients and, and get information from patients, we just don't go and say, hey, how's our staff doing? And they say, we're wonderful. And we think, okay, we're wonderful. And then our results come back on the patient experience and the measure of that, and it isn't so wonderful. But when we gather stories and we find out this nurse made a difference because he or she did this, this, and this, then all of a sudden we have impact. And then when we share those stories, that becomes part of our culture, becomes part of our legend. And then when we hire people into the organization, we tell those stories so that they can emulate and model and copy those exact behaviors. Stories build legends. Legends build the legacy. How do we do that? We've got to develop flexibility. To be very flexible as leaders. Flexibility is not an easy thing for a lot of leaders. Here's my experience with nurse managers. Any nurses in the audience? A couple nurses. Okay, I'm going to pick on the nurses. My experience with nurses, compassionate, nurturing, very caring. 
not very flexible, very task-focused sometimes. Sometimes, not saying all of you, not even saying you guys in the room. Sometimes very task-focused. Go in, take care of a patient, very task-focused, get the things done. Good for patient care, but not good for patient experience. We need to be flexible. Sometimes leaders become so rigid and so, so particular about how things have to be done, they don't allow flexibility. I'm a lab guy. When, when I teach somebody to draw blood on a patient, I teach them a very specific checklist. You need to do it exactly like this. Once they get really good at it, I'm a little flexible in how they do things. As long as it still takes care of the patient, it doesn't violate any, any moral, religious, or legal uh, uh, ethical problems, I'm, I'm going to have a little flexible with that. I had, a, I had a, one particular phlebotomist. Typical phlebotomy is, this is your tube. That you, you draw the blood, the needle's on the end, picture that. So you stick that into the arm, you, drop, you put your tubes in, you've all had your blood drawn, that's how it works. This particular one I had, really, really good at drawing blood. She'd put it in like this, then she'd switch with her left hand, hold the hub, which makes the patient a little nervous because you're switching hands, and then start popping tubes with her right hand. Now, I would never teach that, but it worked for her. Patient experience was really good. She was very good with our patients. It's flexibility, that's where we have to be. We have to encourage courage. I don't think there's an industry like telemedicine, in my opinion, that doesn't encourage courage and take some risks at what we do as, and know is the right thing for our patients. A lot of people's experience with telemedicine is this. You ever remember the House episode? Dr. House, the episode where he was on the camera talking to the couple that were in Antarctica or somewhere trying to do medicine? That's most people's idea of what telemedicine is, right? What they saw on a television show. Dr. Chris Gallagher, who lives in Dallas, is a, a chief medical officer at one of the hospitals I work at. He's also a leading um, uh, gentleman. I don't know if you know Dr. Chris Gallagher, but he is one of the leading folks in Texas when it comes to telemedicine. I learned a lot of things about him, but I also learned it took a lot of courage to do what he did. I took a lot of risk taking. He allows that to happen as organization. Now I support risk taking in this sense. It doesn't harm our patient. We don't want to take risks and harm or patient safety. But we take risks in making things right and doing things right for our patients. And the last one is we've got to enable empowerment. We've got to give people the opportunity to own what they're doing. Not take ownership ourselves. And that's where I come back to sometimes as leaders, we want to micromanage things. We want to hold control. We're not flexible enough to let people do things. Ronald Reagan said this, hire the very best people, put them in their place, and then get out of their way and let them do the things they know are the right things to do. We've got to empower people. We've got to enable that to make it happen. We've got to have a broad perspective. Leaders have to have a broad perspective. Some of you wear glasses. I wear glasses. I just turned 50 years old last year, so I have to wear glasses a little more often than I did before. Turn actually 40. You know, you got to, anybody, well, I'm not going to tell you. They need to raise your hand, anybody at 40 and above, though. So at 40 years old, they tell you, as soon as you turn 40, there's something about your eyes, you need, to read, you need reading glasses. I said, ah, that'll never happen to me. I literally was like the day after my birthday, I think I couldn't see anymore, right, when I turned 40. So I had to start wearing some glasses. And you know, when you get reading glasses, they're kind of like, kind of, kind of sit down like this, you know, you look like grandpa. No offense if you're doing that right now. Um, but, <laughs> but my kids did not want me looking like that. So they said, Dad, you need to get glasses. These are just reading glasses. I can see everything out there. I can read the sign back there. But I put this on. I can't see you know, nothing in front of me. But they said, Dad, you need to get some glasses and wear them all the time. Because that grandpa look, that's just not happening. And of course, my wife was embarrassed to be seen with me in public. So I bought these glasses. And I've been wearing these about a year and a half now. But here's the problem with broad perspective. These glasses limit my vision. I don't drive with these glasses on. One, I don't need them to drive, but they limit my peripheral vision. I feel like I can't see if there's a car in another lane if I'm changing lanes. So they, they kind of make me have some tunnel vision. I don't like it. It's very uncomfortable. So I'll walk around without them many, many times. But then all of a sudden I can't read. And so then you kind of get used to them being on your head. I've actually walked out thinking I had my sunglasses on, but these are my glasses and just, it gets confusing. So I just leave them on now. But I have a broad perspective in, in leadership and I developed that through the Air Force. So when I was in the Air Force, here's some of the cool things I got to do. And I'm a medical guy. I didn't fly airplanes. I can tell you this is a KC-135, but that's all I can tell you about the aircraft, only because I know what it is. Those are F-16 fighter jets underneath. But in the military, in the Air Force, we refuel airplanes in midair. I don't know if you know that. They don't have to pull over at a gas station to get gas. We get it in midair. It's an amazing phenomenon that this boom comes out of the back end of this, this KC-135, which is carrying thousands and thousands of gallons of fuel, and these jet Jets come underneath, they literally will be on the wing and they'll, they'll swing underneath like this and they'll, they'll marry up. And so this boom comes out and the little no nozzle on the top of the F-16, they, they actually, they're like this. They're literally like this flying and all of a sudden, boom, they connect. And it's all through instrumentation and making sure they're at the right level. It's a, very complicated. But we refuel that jet. That jet can fly, that pilot can fly 36 hours nonstop because of the ability to refuel. Now, we don't advocate that because that's a long time without sleep. 
but there are missions that, that that does happen. Here's where my broad perspective is. So when you sit in a KC-135, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like your typical airliner, right? These are not airline seats. My kids, until they were teenagers, this is the only way they traveled. They didn't know how to travel in a commercial aircraft. Now this is great for kids. Here's why. As soon as you take off, now everybody's strapped in these seats on the side, that's a little uncomfortable, but as soon as you get out to that cruising altitude and they say you can walk around, my kids throw out blankets on the floor, sleeping bags, they fall asleep, they run around the plane. It's a great way to travel. And in the Air Force and the military, you can fly that way for free if there's space available, if they don't have a bunch of troops on the plane. And we did that about five times just to Hawaii. That was awesome. Free vacation to Hawaii, my kids think that that's the way to travel. That's the only way they know. They knew at the time. But here's the thing when I, when I think about the perspective of an airplane. Now, in a KC-135, you don't see any windows along the side, right? There's only about three or four windows all the way along that entire plane. And you know of being in a commercial aircraft, you have that little window seat, you know, you got the hole out there, you can see. And when you fly out today, if you haven't seen it flying in, you'll see the, you can see the Grand Canyon. It's amazing when you look down the Grand Canyon from the air. You'll see that today. But here's the perspective that you get is this little hole. And it's not a bad view. A little obscured by the, the, the wing. But this is not a bad view from an airplane. And when I think of leaders who don't have flexibility, who don't take risks, who don't encourage courage, who don't enable empowerment, I think of people who look out the side of the window and only see so much. But here's the thing about this, this KC-135. So when you go back and you look at this boom right here, somebody who controls that actually lays down on the floor, uh, and they have these control panels. They're laying on this pad, and it's this entire glass open pod. We call it a boom pod. And they lay in there, and they control this, this boom. And my kids, I, we've all laid back in there and seen views that you just can't even imagine. Views that look like this, on a B-2 stealth bomber being refueled. That's a scene you don't see from a commercial aircraft, right? You don't see that from a porthole on the side of your, your airplane. And not only that, but you can see, and I've flown, again, I told you I flew to Hawaii, you can see from Baja, California, all the way to Seattle, Washington, at one time. It's a 180 degree view all the way around. It's an amazing viewpoint. Very few people ever get the opportunity to do that. My kids have been so fortunate to be able to have that opportunity, my wife and I as well. In fact, one time, which wasn't really so legal, we, I actually laid down in the boom pod on takeoff. So literally, I'm laying like three feet off the ground, and the airplane's going on at 200 and some miles an hour, and all of a sudden, it takes off, and this whole world just opens up underneath you. It's really kind of freaky, especially if you're scared of heights like I am, but it's also fascinating. But this is the broad perspective we have to have as leaders in order to see the future of what healthcare looks like. We can't see it through that little porthole. We see a little glimpse of it. We see maybe our world, but we don't see this broad view that only few people get to see. That's where leaders have to be. They have to navigate where other people don't navigate. They have to be able to see things that other people don't see. If we're gonna transform healthcare, and transform the patient experience, it starts with transforming our employed employees, our staff, but it starts by transforming our leadership. It's a broad perspective. Then we have to be able to communicate vision. This is Dr. Chris Gallagher. It's a picture of him actually being interviewed by the local TV station in Dallas. I think his folks are over at the HIMSS conference. Um, they've got a setup over there. Access Physicians is their, the name of their group. This is where I learned a lot about telemedicine especially. But his broad perspective on what goes on and how he communicates that vision. How do we communicate that? Here's how we do that. We have to inspire the vision. It's a very different, I teach a lot of leader development. Whoop, we lost it. I teach a lot of leader development. And in that, I talk about how do we communicate vision. First of all, how do we develop vision? Then how do we communicate vision? Here's what I learned from the Air Force on communication. There's always a preparatory command. Again, how many married men do we have? Married men? OK. Have you guys ever been watching television? And your wife maybe starts a conversation, and about halfway through the conversation is where you figure out she's actually talking to you? You ever had that moment? <laughs> Wives, have you ever been there? Right? It just happened the other day. I was at home, and it's just my wife and I at home now with the dog. And she talks to the dog a lot, so I don't know if she's actually talking to me. So I she starts this conversation, and I went, huh? And she went, aren't you listening? I said, if you want my attention, say Mark, and then proceed with the conversation, because I might pay, be more likely to pay attention, unless it's the Green Bay Packers I'm watching or something like that. So, so, so we have to, have, to um, have a preparatory command. So in the Air Force, here's how it works. I was a medic. So in the medical world, we trained all the time to... Um, to haul casualties out of war. Thank God I never had to experience that in real life. But we train for it. And when you train, you, you have a litter. So if you've seen a litter, it's like a cot with two wooden um, um, stakes on each side, and that's what you carry this litter. So you put this patient on here. There's four people that carry a litter. Safety. We're always looking for safety. And, and when the litter's laying out here, the head of the patient is right here. 
I have to kneel down next to this, this, um, cot, this, this litter, I have to grab the handle right here. Somebody's on the other side, they're kneeling down with the left knee, holding with their left hand. Same in the back, both sides. We are all in sync together. Here's the first thing we do. We just don't grab that patient and go, okay, let's go, and we just run because what happens to the patient? They fall off, or they lean sideways, or their head's upside down. We have ways to do this. So here's the preparatory command. I'm at the head because in the right side of the head, that's the lead of the four people. And I say, prepare to lift. And everybody gets ready. Nobody lifts yet. Prepare to lift. And then we go, lift. And we all do it at the same time. Then we stop. We don't move yet. Guess what we do again? Preparatory command. Prepare to move. We're prepared, then we move. And guess what? Here's how we move. I'm on this side. I start out with my left foot forward. If I'm on this side holding the litter, I start out with my right hand forward. Why is that important? So the litter's moving equally along, right? So we, in order to inspire, to inspire the vision, to communicate the message, sometimes we need a preparatory command. We have to be ready to communicate. We've got to accept the challenges that there's going to be, because guess what? Some people are going to push back. If you are taking risks, if you're encouraging courage, if you're enabling empowerment, if you're developing flexibility, people are going to push back on you. People are going to say, we can't do that. I get this all the time, rural hospitals. I work with a lot of rural hospitals. Well, you know, Mark, we're different here. I say, so you're different than the hospital down the street that's getting results? What's different? Now, my hospital in Nantucket, I give them a little bit of, okay, a little pushback maybe because they are different. They have 35 miles out to sea. I get that, a little bit different. I coach an animal hospital too, the only one in Studer Group. We have 400 hospitals we work with. I coach one, one animal hospital and I get the pleasure of coaching them. Healthcare is healthcare, right? So we're still making healthcare better. It just happens to be animal health, which is pretty cool because you never get any pushback from your patients. They just wag their tail, they lick your face, they do all kinds of stuff. It's a lot of fun. But sometimes we're going to get some pushback. Some people are going to say, "Why we can't do it that way. Why can't we? Yesterday, or two days ago, the uh, Forbes billionaire list was, was put out. Did you guys see the Forbes billionaire list? There's now 1,800 billionaires in the country, or in the world, sorry. Eight of the top 10 are in the United States. Bill Gates being the top at 75 billion this year. He fluctuates between 60 and 75 billion. It's hard for him, I'm sure. But you know, here's a guy who, who accepted the challenges, right? And said, he, what was his vision way back? A computer on every desktop, right? So we've got to have that kind of perspective. We've got to communicate that. We have to have short-term goals and long-term goals. Short-term goal, prepare to lift, lift. That's my short-term goal. Prepare to move, move. That's my short-term goal. Where's my long-term goal? To get that patient to the chopper, to the aircraft, to transport them where they need to go to get the medical attention they need. We've got to have clarity. And we don't have clarity unless we have, what's the first word I talked about today? Purpose. We can't have clarity if we don't have purpose. And the last one is identify the tasks and the action plans. Here's what I would say to you. Well, I keep losing the screen there. Show me your calendar today, and I'll show you where you'll be in a month. What is, what's on your calendar? What plans do you have for today, other than being here? Show me your 90-day plan for your life, for your job, for whatever, and I'll show you where you're going to be in five years. Why is that important? Because what we plan for today is going to propel us to the future. So again, my son, when I worked with him, what's your goals? These are my goals. Okay, what's your plan? My kids all know, okay, Dad, we heard it. In a 90-day plan, we get it. My kids are all in a 90-day plan for college and for, for work. Why? Because I know that in order to get to where they want to be, they've got to have a plan. We've got to communicate those plans. It's all about teamwork as well, right? People are invest, when people are invested, they expect to return. When they're, when they're financially invested. When they're emotionally invested, they want to contribute to the organization. Draw them in. Again, you don't have to pursue that, but you can attract. And if you attract people and you show the purpose and you connect to the why and what you do and tie it to the mission, tie it to the vision of who you are and what you are and what you're doing, people will invest emotionally. When they do that, they want to contribute. They want to be a part of what you're doing. And when you develop flexibility and you encourage courage and you take risks and you empower people, they are going to invest emotionally. I love that quote. And engaged employees are there for what they can give you. They want to be a part. They want to have purpose. They want to be tied to the purpose of your organization. They want to have that kind of teamwork. Here's the best example of teamwork when I was in the military. Had this one opportunity. I was the medical representative in a control room on a mission that some of our special operators were doing. They were going to rescue some Americans who were not held captive, but could be held captive and stuck in a country in South America. I won't tell you the country, but it's not a very friendly country. And we had to go in and extract them. We call it extract when we go in and we take them out without anybody really knowing we're there. And I'm in this control room and I'm the medical representative. First and only time I ever got to do this. I'm on the 12 midnight to six o'clock in the morning shift. I'm excited to be there because I've never seen this before. All these screens are up around me. And the screens look like a, 
on, on a Delta flight, you know how you got the little screen in front of you? It's got the little airplane telling you where you're going? That's what it looks like. And these airplanes are different places and all these different maps. I got this guy on the phone over here and he's calling Jamaica because he wants to clear airspace for our airplanes to fly over there so they can make it to South America. And this one's on the, on the phone with Venezuela trying to clear airspace to get over Venezuela. And this one over here is on, in, on trying to create ground transportation and set that up in a particular country so they can go into this other country. That's the kind of teamwork that I experienced in the Air Force. And, and they went in and they extracted those Americans. Now that never even made the news. It was never even on the news, which is great, which means we did it really, really well. We didn't make any mistakes. That's the kind of teamwork we have to have in organizations in order to get to the very top. So I've said all that today in just 40 minutes to say this. What's one thing, one thing tomorrow you're going to do to transform your leadership? What's one thing you're going to do next week after transforming your, talk about what you're transforming leader, what's one thing next week you're going to do that is going to transform the organization and the department and the people you work with? Then the other side of that is what's one thing you are going to do that's going to transform patient experience in a month. Thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate it.